So my name is Lynn Stahl and I appreciate being here and everybody's presence. I've been doing this work for since 1997 and when I had a significant loved one cross the threshold. And so I've been doing the work for a while, but it's co-creative work in that I actually now am doing um, creative activities with my loved ones across the threshold. So um, a lot of this talk will be about that um, and how I do that. So I'm going to see if I can share the screen and, and go right into my talk. Okay, so this is about creating a living relationship with your loved ones who have died. And some of the ideas that I want to share are, first off the bat, is that I honor everyone's path and that I'm um, I would say I call myself a Christian. So that's kind of goes through the work that I, I do. However, the work that I do has been used by different people of different faiths and or spiritual streams. And it's also some of the things that I share might be directly in contrast with, with some or many of the people that might be watching or listening to this. Um, I want to talk a little bit about Rudolf Steiner um, and his impulse in this work. Spiritual evolution, um, talk about what are the qualities of making a living relationship with our loved ones who have died. And these, um, also these aspects of doing, being in service and co-creating. What is that? The importance that I feel that this work is for the, today's world. And then also three types of messages that we get across the threshold that are specific to advice and co-creating. Um, and then I want to bring in the spiritual virtues of truth, beauty, and goodness because they really have helped guide me on this path of what I hear across the threshold. All right, so let's see here. So Rudolf Steiner was a, um, trying to figure out, um, he was a, a scientist, a philosopher. He brought in um, anthroposophy, the wisdom of man. Many of you might know him because he was connected at one point with the theosophists. Um, he was very big, though, about how to spiritualize practical matters of today. So some people might know him from biodynamic agriculture, um, medicine. He revitalized and spiritualized the arts he did. Waldorf education, some people might be aware of. He also was author of about 30 books. Um, he gave over 6,000 lectures uh, from topics from esoteric Christianity, to reincarnation and of course he gave indications for how do we create a relationship with those across the threshold. Um, what I feel that I, I really resonate also with Rudolf Steiner is that he didn't want us to take anything for granted. He really wanted us to um, do our own spiritual research, um, create, follow disciplines, create dis disciplines in our life um, so that we would actually know these things to be true ourselves. This um, work for me is particularly important regarding spiritual evolution. So I like to bring this in because I think it keeps things in perspective of, um, so I, I'll, I'll just talk about on the physical plane, we had the stone age, then we, you know, we went to the industrial age and now we have the internet of things um, where things are technology. Um, and we also have spiritual evolution that through consecutive patterns of birth and death, reincarnation, that we spiritually evolve. Um, in earlier times, we had the faculty of instinctive clairvoyance, where we were guided by the spiritual world and we knew we had a direct connection. However, for us to actually um, progress and become what Rudolf Steiner talks about as the spirits of freedom and love, that it was necessary for us to actually be cut off from the spiritual world as far as like our world became darker and we lost that and we had to become deep, steeped in material so that out of ourselves that and through our own initiatives that we could come back and reunite with God um, so that our 
clairvoyance, our ability to actually meet the threshold, to go across the threshold, is done in a conscious, free manner. And really where we start to cultivate this divine within ourselves, so this term that we're made in the image of God becomes really a reality out of our freedom. And reincarnation gives us this opportunity because on the earth is really where we can learn specific lessons that we can't learn in other parts of the spiritual world. Um, many of us know that um, there are spiritual beings who would never think of incarnating on the spirit on earth. Yet earth is really where we can experience death. And we can also experience how we actually lift the veil between us and those who have died. So this um, work that um, I do, that men is, many people do, is um, cultivating this living relationship and having a long-term relationship with our loved ones who have died. And there was an um, anthroposophist, uh, Albert Steffen, who said, human freedom may choose whether or not to seek and maintain a conscious relationship with the dead. Nothing either from within or from without compels it. It's a deed of purest love. And I know that all of you that are on this um, webinar, this global gathering, that there is something that you know that you can even though it's done in freedom, that you know that you're there because you're here to bring it further and to bring it to other people and, and into their lives. And yet we, we know that we're doing it out of freedom and spiritual evolution, we have the freedom to do that. Um, and I just really love this. And so whenever I get frustrated or I feel like the message isn't, you know, messages aren't coming through or I'm, I feel like I'm faltering. I go back to this quote because I have to really say that if I'm consistent in my practices of what I do to go across the threshold, that it reaches them. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but really it's done out of this great love um, for loved ones across the threshold. Um, and I want to speak about this, this, um, love that goes across the threshold. It's not a holding on love. It's a love that I guess I would call as an agape love, that it really leaves the other person in freedom. So um, I work closely with my daughter and other loved ones, but there's always done in freedom. There is not um, this attachment that can get spiritually sticky if um, if it's done without a selfless heart. So the living relationship to me is something that's consistent and it's conscious. Um, there's no personal gain from it. And as a mother, of course, there's this part of me, um, you know, that, you know, that I um, will always want, you know, I'll always want my daughter to be in the physical world <laughs> and do normal things, go shopping, you know, have your toes painted for goodness sakes. Um, but this work really that there's no personal gain from it, that again, it's done in freedom and it's done based on service. So it's from the perspective of what can I do for my loved one across the threshold? What could they possibly need? And how can I be in service to their spiritual development? Um, and I'll talk a little bit about what that'll look like. And it's made living through our heart forces. So um, there's something about enthusiasm and warmth and reverence. Um, and we carry that and we make that living in our heart as we work with them. And of course, rich in spiritual content and all of this living relationship leads to co-creation with our loved ones who have died. So I've done, my life has totally changed from my work with my loved ones who have died. Um, I was in business before my daughter was born. Um, I was, always had studied spiritual uh, studies. I was always interested in what are the unseen forces that are around us. And, um, but yeah, so when I met Rudolf Steiner's work six months before uh, my daughter had died, I came across the book, 
um, to know higher worlds of his. And so it was from that inspiration that I knew um, to go to his work on how to work with those who have died. One of the things that he talks about right off the bat is to read spiritual materials to our loved ones. And that's what I did. I, I literally read for hours. Um, and I know that I'm like probably over the top for most people, but I really feel that my daughter's destiny and my destiny are interwoven on the spiritual path of sharing this type of work with other people. And so that foundation of spiritual materials, whether you read it daily or weekly, helps to create a spiritual foundation that allows our loved ones to actually find us and it gives them spiritual nourishment. And it's kind of like a conversation um, that it, it allows for this conversation to develop and grow. You, um, I did it through prayers. I did it through reading um, Steiner's work. You can do it from um, reading the Bible. There are just many paths of spiritual materials that you can read. And I talk about it in my book about how to choose spiritual materials. But typically what happens is, is that you have a knowingness within yourself of what to read if this is your path. Um, and if not, you always default to certain um, classics that, um, you know, I, I'd be glad to share. But at the moment, I'm just going to continue on on this list. So you can also study or meditate on spiritual images. And I put down Raphael as the artist because his work is so incredibly rich with spiritual beauty and truths and goodness emanating from each of his paintings. So you could take one of his paintings meditate on it and really bring it to your loved ones in your imagination meaning creating a, a living picture. Um, what happens in this process is that there begins to be then that spiritual ideas can be furthered. So you may have a question when you're reading spiritual materials. Um, you might hold a question between you and your loved ones. They can actually take it up to the spiritual world. I say up because, you know, my lack of better languaging they take it within their spiritual um, world and they can actually feed you back different inspirations of what other books to read or information will come back from somebody else as an answer to a question. So the, this pattern or this, um, I'm going to say habit of, of spiritually studying actually starts to create this dialogue. Um, Oftentimes, and again, if I offend anybody, I apologize because that's not my intention, but there's actually sometimes people are in pain spiritually that they actually are coming to you that you can heal them. And I'll give you an example that um, just one is that um, I, what happened was is that when you start to read to your loved ones, many of your loved ones that you didn't really think of start to come. And there was a colleague of mine when I was working in the business world who had committed suicide. And out of the blue, she came to me and placed in my thoughts, this is Doreen and I need to hear this information and be part of your group. And I had never thought of really bringing her in. Um, so it was really this coming out and she really needed her pain to be healed and that the materials that I was providing provided spiritual nourishment for her and for to be able to heal. And in contrast, I then went and I invited two other people that I knew had committed suicide. And I did hear back from, you know, hear back, but I had one that joined and one that I never felt like um, a response back. So we can help heal their pain. Um, 
Another thing that we can do is complete tasks for them. Um, I'll get, this has happened on several occasions, but one that I talk about in my book is about my, I was reading one morning and my grandmother came at the edge of the couch. And I'm meaning for that is that I got this image of her at the end of, I was sitting at the, on the sofa at the time and I was reading. And um, my grandmother on my father's side was pretty stern. Um, and so it was kind of interesting how she met me. Um, and she came with a specific thing about to, to reach out to my older brother who had handled some things for um, my uncle, my grandmother's son. And she really didn't need to wait until I was done. It was kind of like she needed me to do it then which was kind of interesting that I'm sure that we've all received messages that they don't want you to wait, they want it done now. And I just, so I did. And sure enough, later, and then I sent the email, like grandma said this, and later on in that day, when I was on my email again, I had received a message from my brother saying that he had just concluded wrapping up some things regarding my uncle who had died and, um, so it was like a perfectly beautiful message. And it doesn't seem significant in the, the wise scheme of things, except for the fact that my brother doesn't really believe in this. And so um, I, th I, I think that there's not a frivolity in how the messages are given, but those across the threshold are also concerned about our own spiritual um, health also. And I just... Anyway, I'll share that. So they'll help complete tasks. And I, I can go on about where I've done things for my mother and my dad. In fact, one was um, healing a wound. And I, I knew that my father had come to me about something. So I know that we've all experienced that. But this work on, on this service also will help to allow that to happen. And not only that is that, well, actually, we can track where our loved ones are in the spiritual world and um and that's also i think helpful in what what we read with them and also what we're we're working on to co-create with them um other things that we can do is we take interest in them as far as where they're at um, we recognize their unique qualities and what they brought to the world um, we also help them prepare for their next incarnation. And so my work with Eurythmy and color work, not only did they help heal me. So when I started to do all this, I started to reading and then I got led to um, do study colors and the spiritual um, aspects of color. Then I started to painting. So, I mean, like I was not a painter, an artist in our family, my mother was. And in fact, she painted at home um, quite a bit, um, but she never really saw herself fully in that place. And uh, so I was able to really bring this color work, not only to my daughter, but also to my mother. And I felt her presence and I continue to feel her presence in that area of my work. Um, and then with the Eurythmy, um, I, I, I don't know how many of you know what Eurythmy is, but it's movement work that's connected to the sounds of speech. And um, every vowel and every consonant um, has an archetype gesture, and they're connected to the creative spiritual forces of the zodiac and the planets. So you're really working with spiritual components when you're working with Eurythmy. And it's similar to, well, it's not similar, but just to give you an idea, the Greeks and the Hebrews, they knew about the power of the sounds, each of the sounds, because they actually named them, right? Alpha, Omega, where when it went to the Roman time period, it became more abstract, and we've lost the power of the sounds of the words, and Eurythmy works with that. And so it's really, because it is a spiritual, you're actually engaged with spiritual forces when you're doing it, those in the spiritual world see it. And, and so um, I feel like I was drawn to that, not only because of that, 
that doorway that it opens for me, but also the fact that I think it's significant that if we don't have a capacity, oftentimes if a capacity is held back from us. So for example, my daughter, um, she was born quote unquote normal, whatever normal is, right? And then um, in her, about a year after she was born, she lost some capacities to move um, and her physical body. And so I think that there's some significance to why I ended up going to um, Eurythmy School because it is a art form of movement that I feel very much that my daughter will be able to use in her future life, incarnation. Um, as well as the only probably reason why I got through Eurythmy School, because it's a four-year full-time training, for me it was seven years part-time full-time, is that I received extra spiritual substances um, from her and those who have crossed the threshold. So those people, children, people who die at a younger age, adults who die at younger age, they have spiritual substance that they can actually lend to those are living on the physical plane to use to complete deeds and this is a key resource that we can use today um, especially when we feel overwhelmed in life um, so anyway, to, so to prepare for their next incarnation, um, we, I do work on that level. And then also to co-create on a humanity level. And I know this, I'm not trying to sound lofty because we're all doing our parts, but I think it's significant when we can actually start to spiritualize the arts, spiritualize agriculture, spiritualize our medicine, um, spiritualize how we walk down the street, right, and meet the other person. Um, and my co-creative work, my, my service work, actually gone into technology. Now, I know that a couple, I could have even been a month or so ago, when I tuned in very, um, I caught the tail end of a gentleman who had talked about the 5G. Well, technology came into my life a couple years um, ago as far as being an issue that the dead actually are engaged with. And so I just, I'll talk a little bit about that on the next page, but, um, oh no, maybe I'll talk about it here. So um, what had happened was, is that I'm, I'm in a therapeutic training for Eurythmy. So I have my diploma, you know, undergraduate, I'm going to a therapeutic program. This has been several years afterwards. And this was back in 2016. And um, I get the feeling to withdraw from the program. And I'd already been in it a year and a half. And typically, if I commit to something, I'm going to stay there. However, I had a strong sense of feeling that came to me that I was to that I had an opportunity, a small window of time, to, um, to go down another path. And at some point, my integrity, my spiritual integrity, had now always defaults to what I'm hearing from my loved ones in the spiritual world. I, at least I try that on that level. And so I had to really go against my typical habit of completing no matter what. And I withdrew and come to find out then this whole idea, the, not the idea, but the smart meter issue, the 5G, and then really going civically into um, my city and my state on this issue. I still at that time did not know what its relationship was to the dead. Um, and then what happened was is that then I met somebody who told me about the work that Steiner does on technology and the dead. And then that's when um, I became engaged with Mistech. I've got a logo up there, um, where we really study about the spiritual impulses behind technology and the dead's relationship to them, to, to the issue of technology, and how do we bring morality into technology? Because like the industrial age, the internet of things is not going away. 5G is not going to go away. How do we um, make ourselves um, healthy within that system and bring morality to artificial intelligence so that humanity can continue?
So those who have died have um, led me to going now back. I've, I've had the feeling to leave the civic area, to go back to the training with this new impulse of, um, from a therapeutic standpoint, what do we do with the, bar- the, the bombarding of radiation, the, the continuing atmosphere of radiation and electromagnetic uh, fields. So I'm going to just pass this by because we'll come back to it. Um, There are three ways that I get these inspirations that come through. Um, And typically they can be through another human being. Um, And they'll, from, I've had this happen from writing a book to continuing training um, and also just having Mary, Mary Beth introduce us. When somebody else carries something um, that gets my attention, um, um, it, and this can work sympathy or antipathy, that will change your biography and how co-creative that you work. Um, also, the next one is about feelings, and I just explained how that happened with my training and the 5G issue. And then um, there can be a thought that's just placed in you out of the blue. And what I always tell people is that any of the great thoughts, any good thoughts that I get, I know they're coming from my loved ones who have crossed the threshold. And um, that can be from when I got out of Eurythmy school and I got the impression to do a hundred talks to celebrate a hundred years of Eurythmy. And that led me to working in the prisons and bringing Eurythmy into um, people who were in the prisons, et cetera. So, um, Literally, my life has directed and gone to a different path because of my work with the dead and this conscious relationship that I've developed with my daughter and my mother and a circle of people that we've been working with together for over 20 years. Um, uh, There's five steps for co-creating, from creating a spiritual foundation to learn how to effectively communicate with them create an awareness of what's going on in our days. And I do that through a daily review um, at the end of the night. And then I acknowledge them. And I think the big thing that I really want to hone in on is this consciousness about it. Um, and also gratitude of, um, of, of for it. Um, I use truth, beauty, and goodness um, to help guide me on that and determine and be discerning about the activities that I do. Um, and truths, always remind you of your spiritual heritage. Um, Beauty reminds you, it radiates beauty, and goodness creates a substance for the future. It's a spiritual substance. It's like will forces that are available to you. So exciting to hear so many people in so many different paths of how we can be in service and maintain a relationship with our loved ones and um, out of freedom and out of love and that the, the need is today for us to be doing it. Now is the time in spiritual evolution to take this on and the more that it can normalize, um, I think the healthier it can be and really from if we can and you know and I say this just from that they want to help humanity you know they they, they're going to be you know if you believe in reincarnation they're going to be coming back and they i think they'd like a world that might be a little bit more receiving and receptive place to, to come into and land into and so a lot of like my book and my easy and deep grief product they really give you the, the, the points of how do I co-create with them that actually can support and create activities now. It's a little bit different than the conversations that um, some people have expressed that are so heartwarming and necessary. This just takes it into a, um, you know, it really, it, it takes it into a, a path of activity so that like I as a mother whose child died, like I can be actually proactive in my work with my daughter and also in my work with those that I love that have crossed the threshold that seems to, you know, that has grown. So I think that that's the message that I'd like to close with. Now, can you just briefly tell us about your book and your video course that you have? Sure. So the the book I actually wrote afterwards, um, the video course I did first, and it's a, um, a, there are six modules that have both content and then activity. And the activities are based on the content, obviously, but they're more from the artistic perspective 
um, color work, movement work, um, because I really feel that that's an area that will help transform a lot of things in today's world. Um, and But we'll take it everybody from, well, here's, it takes everybody from how to communicate, what to communicate, um, languaging, um, how, to, how to create a spiritual foundation, etc. cetera. Um, well, that, I'm sorry, this is the book. And then the uh, video product is called Easing Grief. And so the, that's video. Um, and this is the book. Um, I typically, if somebody purchases the Easing Grief product, I send this book to them because I think it's a really great companion and goes into a little bit more in depth. Um, and because I wrote it afterwards, new things, as we all know, comes about. Um, but I, it's material that I wish that I would have had when I started out. And, um, and it really came from them. It came from my work with my loved ones um, who have crossed the threshold. And again, just as um, it was Sherry that just um, had spoken about that they really want to be working with us. And I think each one of us know that. Mary, Mary Beth, have you done Lynn's course? Is that? Yes, my sister and I are both doing it. Um, I'm doing it from a healing perspective for uh, people that I work with. And my sister Diane uh, lost her husband in August, so she's been doing it um, at a very personal level. And I want to shout out to my other sister, Laura, who's on the group. I invited her to come today. Oh, lovely. Hi, she's Laura. In <laughs> Oops. She's in Oregon, and we're in New Jersey. But I want to um, also say that um, my feeling about uh, Lynn's book and course is that it's such a win-win situation. I mean, so many times when we lose somebody that we love, we're grieving so much and uh, we want them to talk to us. We want to know that they're okay. But by the same token, they, want, they need something from us. And I feel like this uh, nourishment or love that we share with them, either by reading to them or doing the artwork and calling them in to be with us while we do this, or our eurythmy. Um, I just feel like it's such a uh, togetherness with our loved one that we're, we're sharing with them and they're sharing with us. And I think many of you have already said that in different ways, but I just wanted to say I really feel strongly that the, the basis of, of Rudolf Steiner's work that Lynn has incorporated in her book and her course uh, are well worth the effort. Uh, um, and that's just about me and how you can connect.